The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Strong mayors, weak democracy? That's how critics see new powers granted to some municipal leaders by the provincial government. We'll debate that tonight. Then, with the siren call of holiday shopping well underway, Paul Burton, the editor-in-chief of the Hamilton Spectator, is here on his new book, Shopomania, Our Obsession with Possession. It's Tuesday, November 29th, and that's next on The Agenda. Earlier this fall, the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa got new powers from the province as part, they say, of Ontario's bid to get housing built more quickly. Now there's a new bill to make those so-called strong mayor powers even more powerful, along with major changes to regional governments. With us now on what these measures could mean, let's welcome Josh Matlow, City Councillor for Ward 12, that's Toronto St. Paul's. Karen Stintz, who's a former Toronto City Councillor. Luca Bucci, former Chief of Staff to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. He's now the Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Home Builders Association. Eric Lombardi is founder of the housing advocacy group More Neighbours Toronto. And Alex Pearson, AM640 radio host of the eponymously named Alex Pearson Show. It's great to have everybody around the table here. You for the first time, I mm -hmm. think. This is I made it. I really feel like I made it. A couple of Hamiltonians yeah. here. Do I tell them that you men mentored me at one point? No? You could. Yeah. I, I think it's a bit late okay. if you didn't want to say it because you've said it now. <laughs> there you go. i got to do a full disclosure thing, and uh, that is because Luke is here with the Home Builders Association, and i got a brother who's a home builder. That's right. Who builds homes in the uh, Hamilton, Halton, and I think some Niagara region as well. So we put that on the table for everybody's full disclosure. Josh, you first. Let's just clarify what has happened here. Initially, the province intended to give the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa these so-called strong mayor powers, and then they sort of put that on steroids. So tell everybody now, what is all this, what are the new powers that have you concerned? Well, I think it's really important to understand both what this is about and also equally what this is not about. So I don't think any of us, and certainly no one on this panel, would disagree that housing has to be a top priority for every government uh, in this country, um, because we are in a bona fide housing crisis. What uh, Bill 3, and certainly Bill 39, does not do is address housing in any way, shape, or form. Now, I disagreed with Bill 3, which provided some stronger mayor powers to John Tory and would have with Mayor Sutcliffe in Ottawa, although he rejected those, uh, mm -hmm. those gifts. Um, but I recognize that, you know, veto powers, uh, appointments to committees, stuff like that, is, there is a precedent in the United States, so we, I think, reasonable people who believe in democracy can debate those powers. What Bill 39 does is something unprecedented in any elected legislative body in the world. Toronto, given that John Tory secretly requested these powers during the municipal election that Doug Ford agreed to, would become the only elected body in the world that can pass resolutions by minority rule, meaning that that is the antithesis of democracy. Now, I believe that we need to expedite and make sure that we focus our attention on housing, on transit, on all the priorities in the world uh, that are important to the citizens of this city and this province. But I think any reasonable person would agree that we should at least remain a democratic body. And that is what John Tory and Doug Ford have done. They have actually diminished the role mm. of councillors, diminished the voices of communities, and have now created something that I think should uh, worry anyone who believes in democracy in this country, which is now there's a precedent in Toronto for minority rule. A third of council, along with the mayor, can make a decision about any matter that the mayor deems to be in provincial interest over the opinion of the majority, which is unheard of. So if Bill 39 passes, that's what the new Ontario will look like. And I want to get some reaction around the table as to what we think about that. You used to be on council. Yes. Could you live under this new proviso? Well, there would be you know, a big question about why would you have councillors if you're going to do this. And uh, I, I agree with Councillor Matlow. I, you know, I think this new piece of legislation is troublesome because I, it's, the underpinning of it is that it will build more housing. It won't build more housing. What it will do, it will concentrate power. And we talk about democracy as if it's um, some thing to the side of us that we really shouldn't pay much attention to. But the reality is democracies are built 
inherent within every democracy is a check and balance system. And what's been created right now is a power, uh, a decision-making body with zero check on its power. And that should be troubling for this existing mayor, and it should be troubling for this existing premier, because what he's done is not time-based. What he's done is forever change the makeup of how decisions are made in the largest city in this country. And it will effectively be made by a gang of eight and the mayor. And that, that, should worry, that should worry everybody. You say it should worry everybody, but I think it probably doesn't worry Luca. Well, let's look at, let's look at some facts here, right? Everybody in the city of Toronto has an opportunity to vote for the mayor. City councillors are elected by a small portion of the city based on their neighborhood or jurisdiction or area of jurisdiction. And what the legislative d legislation does, it primarily focuses these new powers on matters of provincial priority. And right now, the only matter of provincial priority that have been identified through the regulation is housing. So you have a mayor who has been democratically elected by the entire city on an agenda who, that is focused on growth and, and you know, building homes, um, working with the province on a priority issue that is front and center of the political agenda. So I would argue it's, it's not as undemocratic as people might think, because there is an opportunity for people, when the mayor comes into an election period, to vote for his mandate. And that is consistent across the city. And again, these powers are specifically focused right now on matters of housing. And to be honest, the city of Toronto doesn't really have a great reputation when it comes to moving housing priorities forward. Um, you know, last year, you know, this isn't, sorry, this isn't just exclusive to market housing, it's also applicable to affordable housing. Last year, the city of Toronto came to the government to get a zoning order for an affordable housing project that was funded through the Rapid Housing Initiative, which is a federal pro pro program um, that gives money for capital costs of construction of affordable housing projects. Um, this project was at Cummer Avenue in North York. Um, the municipal process didn't lend itself to the timelines that were set by the federal government for this funding. Um, and then the municipality was left going to the province to fast track the process. Through these new powers, the mayor can take it upon himself to use you know, mechanisms within uh, city council, mechanisms within city government to get those projects online more quickly. So it, I, I would argue it really isn't an undemocratic practice. You have a democratically elected mayor setting priorities that are based off of a mandate that he took to the people of Toronto on a matter that is top of mind for the majority of people, not only in the city, but in this province. Okay, Josh, I know you're champing at the bit to get in there. I mm -hmm. see you shaking your head, but let me get everybody for one response first. Where are you on this? Uh, you know, I have a reasonably in the middle opinion on this because, you know, the way I see it, we have two issues. One is we have a housing crisis in this province and time and time again, we see that no level of government is really willing to be accountable to solving this issue, despite the fact that many of the levels of government have within their purview the tools to solve this crisis. When it comes to the strong mayor powers that are being granted to John Tory, Everything that the province can expect John Tory to do, the province could also do instead. And so it bears the question of why doesn't the province actually make these legislative changes that are desperately needed across the region because it's not just a Toronto problem anymore. So that's really one fact. But there is a second fact here in that municipal councils across the province are not really being held accountable to what I would call democratic outcomes. And I think we can see that the fact that the municipal level of government is becoming increasingly irrelevant in the days, in the lives of people in this province. You look at voter turnout, not even one third bother to show up. And I think there is a reasonable question to ask about, for the mayor in particular, the only citywide elected office with the, the only one with a citywide mandate, what ability should they have to see an agenda <coughs> through in their term? I think the biggest problem is not that municipal government is delivering. It, we need dramatic reforms to make it operate much better. But what we've been deprived of is a debate on what the future of municipal government looks like and how to actually systematically change things such that we actually see outcomes that are democratic in nature. And a perfect example of this is on the vote on rooming houses that you know, we continue to punt to study because council cannot get it done. Can and I can I do a quick follow up with you here? Yeah. Are, my guess is, are you the only tenant here on this uh, of this group? I'm actually not a tenant. You're not a tenant? No. You live in a home that you own? Yes, I own my condo. Wow, good for you. I thought yeah. so. You're a young guy who managed to uh, buy some property in this town. 
Yeah, I, I did, and I'm incredibly fortunate. You know, I, I both had family help, and I have the privilege of working in the technology sector, which is one of the few um, areas people my age can, you know, be able to afford what was once possible to a middle class person. But for me, advocacy is so important because I see so many of my friends who went into totally normal middle class professions who've seen the latter in a very short period of time totally pulled up upon them. And the urgency at the political level, which is dominated by people who aren't feeling this as much themselves, is just not there. And when we're talking about housing as an issue, the reality is we have not seen accountability from anyone. And it's just hot potato passing between every level of government because no one at the end of the day wants to be caught holding the bag and things keep getting worse. Okay, we got two and two here so far. Alex Pearson, you get to break the tie. Mm -hmm. Where are you on this? For me, it's an issue of transparency. You know, we were in an election, and I don't have fundamentally a problem with the mayor of the biggest city in the country getting more powers. I mean, we've seen it in other cities, we've seen it in America, we've seen it in Europe. So I don't have fundamentally a problem with more powers. What I have a problem with, and I think what the electorate has a problem with, is finding out after the fact, mm -hmm. is finding out, well, just trust me. Well, no, you don't ask for the trust after the fact. You build that trust before <laughs> and take it to the electorate. I mean, John Tory likely would have very much still won with the same amount of votes. But you can't come out after the fact and tell people this is how it's done and this is what we're going to do and then just say, trust me. We've seen too many times at every level, whether it's the federal government with the EA Act, whether it's the provinces using the notwithstanding clause, and now we've got these backroom deals. And I think over time, people turn around and say, why should I trust you? You can't get stuff done when we elect you to do it. And so what, you wield out these powers and these backroom deals to get stuff done? doesn't sit well, and it shouldn't sit well. For, so for me, it's a transparency issue. We actually had two elections this year. Yeah. We had a provincial election in June mm -hmm. on which this was not campaigned on, yeah. and a municipal mm -hmm. election in yeah. October in which this was not campaigned on. So you got a problem in both cases. I have cases. a problem because I have a radio show. So an election, <laughs> and, and, and we would talk about these issues. Like, I would have talked about this. This was yeah. one of those, I mean, Toronto's election was a very consequential election. The city's not run very well. We have a huge budget over. Um, shortfall. We've got red, dead raccoons that you can't get picked up. We've got potholes you can't get filled. We've got the housing crisis and, and, and. So there's a lot of crime. And yet, you know, no one really talked about it. And no one talked about the elephant in the room that no one knew existed. So I promise you, this would have been talked about had anyone known. Did you want to go back to that issue that I saw you shaking your head about a few I, minutes ago? I, I appreciate that because you know, my, my friend Luke has you know, suggested even <clears throat> that, that, that you know, the Cummer uh, uh, Affordable Housing Modular Housing issue, the reality of that, as you may remember, is that actually the local councillor at the time supported it. It was the MPP, the Conservative Correct. MPP, it who did didn't. And it was actually one of the few instances where the government did not award uh, a ministerial zoning, a zoning order to push it through. So in fact, yet again, to Eric's point, the Ford government, like any provincial government, if they wanted to upzone neighborhoods tomorrow, if they wanted to approve that, in other words, they can do whatever they want. They could change uh, the, the name of Toronto to Ford Nation if they chose to, although please don't share that suggestion because it might happen. And the reality is, the government of Ontario is not actually acting on the hyperbole and the rhetoric that they're expressing about housing. And now we are caught in this sort of gaslighting, uh, red herring debate about a strong mayor power that should not be used by any democracy. So, um, you know, I, I only want to just correct the record about how that sort of happened. Ultimately, and by the way, to Eric's point earlier, uh, yes, it was a shameful low turnout in the municipal election, but as it was with the provincial election too. Uh, it was actually an unprecedented low turnout in the provincial election, which is, again, another matter about the health of our democracy. But what John Tory and Doug Ford did further hurts and diminishes our democracy. It actually tells people that your voice doesn't matter, your elected representative's voice doesn't matter. And yes, John Tory has a mandate of the entire city, but collectively, the city council does too, together. And we Although are Although he got to, more votes than all of you put together. And I had a higher margin. I mean, you know, we can compare these things. The reality is that we elect a council to Karen's point, that there should be a check and balance. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not long in our history where we can, you know, recount Rob Ford's tenure as mayor. And under, you know, and actually, you know, Karen, Karen at times, um, when it came to transit and other important priorities to us, if she and we didn't have the majority of votes, to contest when Rob Ford wanted to just completely destroy Transit City or other matters, 
we wouldn't have been able to keep him in check. And when he went through, um, you know, a, a sensational episode where our democracy, the function of our city was at question, it was because he didn't have this minority rule power that the majority of council was able to keep you know, you can argue how well it was done, but at least keep, you know, keep the machine moving. But Karen, let me circle back to something you said, which was, and the whole point we're told of this new law is that it's the only way to get houses built, enough houses built, without all of the nimbyism and other obstacles that get in the way. And you said, no, it won't. It absolutely how do you, won't. How do you but know that it won't get more homes built? I can guarantee you it won't get any more homes built. But the other thing that I find just delightful is that the last time I was on your show in person, we were debating the reduction of council from 45 to 25. And the theory was it would make council run so much more efficiently. Well, it's running so much more efficiently, now it actually <laughs> needs to be eight. Yeah. Right? So on its face, that argument has zero merit. Houses are being built all over the city all the time, every day. John Tory used to tout that we had the most cranes in North America building housing in our city. And that's why you can't go down any street without running into construction. So the entire notion that we need these powers to get housing built is nonsense, just complete nonsense. The issue with Cummer, that, wouldn't, that would not have been fixed with any intervention of a strong mayor, none. That was a bureaucratic response. And as Josh pointed out, Councillor Matlow pointed out, the councillor was in favour. Council was in favour. It was the local MPP who was not. And who carried the day. And who yes. carried the day. Now, to your point, will more housing get built? No. There's approved housing today that has been cancelled because of interest rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we look at what's happening in the Greenbelt, the land purchases that have been happening over the last couple of weeks in advance of this announcement, nobody pays $50 million at an interest rate of 23% to build housing. Mm -hmm. And that's what is happening. There is no affordable housing that will come out of this at all. If the government was serious about affordable housing, they would have bought the land in the green belt. They could have purchased it and actually built affordable housing. They didn't. So there's a lot of people that are winning. It's not going to be people who need housing. I, well, go ahead. I think there are a lot of misconceptions in, in this argument, right? Because you know, I hear this as a housing advocate all the time. Oh, look at all the cranes. They're building so much housing. But the fact is that we have such intensity in the scale of these buildings is actually a lot more expensive to build than wood-framed housing in neighborhoods. And so the fact that a lot of these projects are penciling out actually speaks to the fact that the policies in place do not facilitate the creation of housing in the places people want to be living at a reasonable price. And yes, the government actually has a huge impact on both the soft costs of housing projects and the hard costs, materials and labor, because supply chains cannot reorient themselves to deliver things or deliver more housing more frequently if the regulatory environment doesn't exist such that the risk is going to be worthwhile. And so when we talk about these stronger mayor powers, do I think that they're healthy for our democracy? No. Do I think they were the right reform on municipal government? No. I'm a strong proponent of having municipal po po political parties because at least that way there can be some form of citywide mandate that includes the councillors. But, you know, we see on last council, you know, we could not legalize literally having roommates in, you know, three quarters of our land area. And, you know, to me, that is something that would absolutely get done under this new rule. Well, let me pick up on that if I can. I'll go to you on this, Alex, because uh, again, this is the explanation the provincial government has given. Mm -hmm. There's too much nimbyism. There are too many councillors who don't want to see gentle increases in density in their wards, mm -hmm. so the explanation goes. And therefore, we need to have it in such a way where the mayor and third council can get together and that's enough. Do you buy that argument? No. I don't buy anything any politician says anymore because we've well. seen... To, no, I don't, because we get the talk, we don't get the walk. It's not enough to have the headlines in the news all the time about what we're going to do. Do it. The calls I get from people are, I don't want to hear about it anymore, I just want to see it, get it done. So when we hear about these announcements of the strong mayor powers, we're going to get all this housing built, we're talking three or four years before a shovel even goes in the ground because it has to be planned, the municipalities are going to have to deal with the infrastructure. Nothing's going to be built overnight. And what people are being filled with is this, this hope of something that's not going to exist for many, many years. And we're so far behind, and, and I mean, frankly, you know, with StatsCan coming out and warning, by the way, there's six million people coming to the province of Ontario over the next two decades. I mean, where have they been? What have people been doing? What is the Wynn, McGuinty government? What have all these governments been doing while they're announcing all the housing that never seems to get built, ever? Like, it, we get the announcements, we don't get the housing. Let me pluck something out of that and put it to Luca, which <clears throat> is, 
one of the other criticisms we're hearing about this is that the servicing of the land that is now going to be built on, which maybe wasn't intended to be built on before, is, you know, we're talking about sewers, we're talking about hydro, we're talking about all the things you've got to do to service land to make, to make it eligible for people to live there. That's going to cost municipalities untold amounts of money going down the road, which has not been factored. Taxpayers. taxpayers, you're right, exactly. Which has not been factored into any of this. Is that a fair comment? Um, with respect to the strong mayor's powers, is that what you're, you're asking? Well, the, fa the fact that they're going to be able to start building, not, not their words, my words, right. I guess, willy-nilly, in all sorts of places <laughs> which wasn't allowed before, right. is going to require a lot of servicing of land that was un otherwise unanticipated. Mm -hmm. And municipal taxpayers will have to pay for that, and there's no provision in any of the provincial legislation to account for that. Um, that's a good question, and... I thought so, too. It's a great question. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, we're looking, you at, you know we're looking at uh, where houses are going to be built and how houses are going to be built. You know, we have to kind of appreciate that there is still elements of input from both municipality and, you know, local constituents on how these units are going to come online and how servicing to these units are going to be, um, for lack of a better term, financed or, or, or attributed to that housing project. Right? So despite the fact that you're increasing powers to a mayor or despite the fact that the province is coming in um, and restructuring the way that development charges happen, there's still an element of local decision making, making that is embedded in that process where um, local constituents, local councillors are going to have an opportunity to tell uh, municipal decision makers, whether it's on the, the side of the um, city staff or on the side of the political arm of, of the city government, you know, how they want to see things built. Um, the interesting thing about the strong mayor's bill, it will give the mayor the opportunity to prioritize what projects come to council first and how those projects move through council in an expedited way. And I actually don't think that's a bad thing because it helps us bring that kind of housing online more quickly. And that's not just market-based housing, that is affordable housing as well. I mean, you look at some of our colleagues that are in the affordable housing space, um, Habitat for Humanity, Indowell, they're sitting there in some cases waiting for permits to be issued to bring in some of that servicing that you're talking about. Um, now they have a mechanism to, to you know, lobby the mayor's office or local city councillors to help bring some of that online. How do they lobby a council? Uh, they have no power. But that's not how it works. I don't for, think for, so. I mean, you still have to get four councillors online. Josh councillors is can my councillor. Am Luke, I going Luke, to him Luke, when, Luke, when Luke, something Luke, goes Luke, wrong? Because he doesn't uh, have any power. I, I just, I can, yeah. I mean, we, I'd love to have a coffee with you. And sure. sort of, you know, we'll, <laughs> get, we'll, get into, we'll get into all this Absolutely. when we have more time. But you know, the reality is, first of all, even though your question was wonderful, it was on Bill 23. <laughs> um, you know, we have so many of these sort of fireballs mm -hmm. being thrown at us that it is easy to sort of conflate them. And th that's why I said earlier, this isn't actually about housing Bill 39. This is about a power grab by John Tory and Doug Ford. Um, you know, John Tory will have, even with this new bill, will not be expediting permits. That's not the way it works. And, you know, the reality is, once again, Doug Ford could change things if he wanted to. He's deferring, he's actually neglecting his ability to do so. He's creating this gaslight red herring of a strong mayor power. And what we should be debating, frankly, is how to move forward with these priorities, everything to do with housing and transit, to getting the snow shoveled and dealing with the very you know, clear municipal issues that we should be addressing better. And the raccoons, <laughs> especially the one at your house. <laughs> well, he's not, but, dead, not dead yet, but he's going to get there. But, but the very fact that after after this municipal election, we find out that John Tory made this request, mm -hmm. that he got that request granted, and or it seems to be moving in that direction now. He is not disavowing it. And ultimately, what we are now debating is whether or not Toronto will be the only legislative body in the entire world elected that will have a mayor using minority rule powers is absurd, obscene, and wrong. Let me follow up on that with you, because you've... Uh, Josh doesn't necessarily have the most positive relationship with Mayor Tory, if I can put it that way, <laughs> but you have a pretty good relationship I with like Mayor Tory, think I think. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you, Yeah. why would he want this? Why would he put a target on his own back by asking for these extraordinary powers that no other, as Josh says, legislature in the world has? I, I'm not going to speak to why John accepted this and why he advocated for it if, in fact, he did. I don't know. Those aren't conversations I've had with him about this matter. Um, what I do think is that it leads to lazy decision-making. 
Meaning what? Uh, meaning that, you know, the Ford government just, you know, they've just decided the green belt's now open for development without actually thinking through what that might mean. You know, now we actually have a home builders association that thinks the mayor can expedite permits, which they can't. It has people believe that we're going to actually have rooming houses approved, but they're not. And so all of it, it, it creates and feeds into a level of cynicism, which I think is really bad for the republic, body republic, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I think it's bad for decision makers and is bad for um, every level of government authority. What and also what really is, from my perspective, the most damaging is the fact that we do have a housing crisis. And so while we're having this little discussion about what's going on here, we're not actually fixing the real issue, which mm -hmm. is how do we afford to embrace six million people in Ontario over the next? It's not a small thing. thing. It's not a small May, thing. May and because it's not just housing. Sorry, and I, yeah, and I will. Please, yeah, please, but it's not just housing. It's transportation. Totally. It's school. Why do you want to build an entire like new city within a city and not one ounce of money goes to education? And we need we need school capacity. We need child care. We need parks, infrastructure, right. which we have a dirt. We need of. to be able to flush your toilet. But, but, and once but, again, but housing the point, is the last list on the priority when we're talking not. about these things, it's right? Not. So can we I agree on one thing though? Just just to Karen's point though, uh, on on rooming houses, the irony is. Um, I think I heard a, a stat that John Tory, even with his meager, mm -hmm. relatively strong mayor powers that he has today, um, has been successful in roughly 96% of the votes. So the rooming houses vote may be the one kind of consequential one uh, that he said he didn't have the ability to get through. The reality is, with the new election being, being over, uh, we have the majority of votes to move forward with rooming houses. He's not lost on the 30 other housing-related items at council. So it also begs the question that you posed to Karen, which of course none of us really know the answer to, why would he request these undemocratic powers, um, and I don't know if I don't know if anyone can answer that other than John Tory. But frankly, I think you know the city is moving faster and further with, enha with enhanced housing opportunities in neighborhoods than the provincial government is doing in Bill 23. Yep. The city is moving forward with. Not enough, not good enough, but frankly, far more than the province has on substantive uh, housing-related priorities. Luca, maybe you could help us with this, because uh, the conventional wisdom today is that the mayor of Toronto asked the premier of Ontario for these powers, and the premier of Ontario, even though he didn't campaign on it, granted him this authority. Do you know that to be, in fact, the case? I, I can't speak to that. I'm not privy to conversations that the mayor would have with the premier. I do know that within the uh, provincial government, uh, prior to the election, there was a sentiment that a lot of um, priority housing initiatives may have moved through municipalities at a rate that was um, slower than desired, which could have contributed to a uh, supply issue within the province. Um, and there was a serious amount of discussion uh, you know, around how can we make these processes quicker. Okay, um, can and I you ask see you a real smart sure. question as a follow-up sure. now? Absolutely. Okay, you used to work for Steve Clark. I did. Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister. Yes. The once and still. Okay, he used to be a mayor. He was. Can you imagine when he was a mayor, whether he would have thought this was kosher? I can't speak to that either. <laughs> I can't speak to that either, because discussions on strong mayor powers, to be completely honest, happened after my tenure in his office. You think he's totally on side with all of this? I think the provincial government is looking for ways to work with municipalities to move processes when it comes to home building. It's not what uh, I to, 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 you to think short, he's totally to short on side with all of this? The short they're handing the hot potato the hot. back to the municipalities. Right. That's what so they're doing. I can't speak to the, the political sentiment around the strong mayor powers within the government, because, again, that happened at a time after I was the chief of staff. Um, but I will say that the government has been focused on trying to find ways to shorten those processes that are related to building homes in this province. This isn't the way. Because there is a supply crisis in this country, or in this province. We have to build... 150,000 homes year over year for the next 10 years. It won't years. happen. And it to put it in happen. perspective, it's not going to happen. To put it in perspective, the best housing start we had on record was in the year 2020, I believe, and we built 100,000 homes. So we have to increase that efficiency by 50% consistently over the next 10 years. So it doesn't surprise me that the province is looking at, you know, um, let's call it pretty pretty significant measures through Bill 3, through Bill 30, 20, uh, 23, and through Bill 39 to move these processes along more quickly because the convention, at least at Queen's Park, is that there is some sort of uh, tension or delay in the system and that is happening at the municipal level. Now, I can appreciate that there is a dis 
there there is more to that that argument and there's a lot of municipalities coming out and saying well you know there are people sitting on um, approved lots you know the market is fluctuating supply chain etc cetera, etc cetera. but a lot of what the government has done through bill 108 more homes more choice okay. Bill 109 and bill 23 has been focused on getting these municipal processes more streamlined and more efficient I get it I get it but you're hearing considerable pushback on the table here mm -hmm. on her radio show mm -hmm in the broader public that this isn't the way to do it. Exactly. If this was the aim, is there a better way, let me ask you, is there a better way for it to have been done? I think there is a better way for it to be done. I mean, I think first of all, you know, the province is ignoring its own housing affordability task force major recommendations in which, you know, increasing density in existing neighborhoods was the major theme of that report. Four stories and four units by right. And, you know, I do think that we suffer... That was dead on arrival, though, Eric. That was dead on arrival. The, his former boss said there's no support for that yeah, right now. Yeah, and so he's talking about how bold, you know, he's being on housing and, you know, standing up to the NIMBYs, in which case, you know, the policy, the number one policy that was recommended, too bold. So, you know, is Steve Clark now the big banana? I don't know. But I think what we're suffering from in, in this province, and particularly at the municipal level, is a shortage of imagination. Because when it even comes to these changes, for example, to uh, development charges that are reducing budgets, well, the goal here really should be about, OK, well, you can increase the amount of development charges you collect by making sure more housing gets built. And you can reduce the amount of infrastructure investments that you need to make by ensuring that that housing is directed to places where ample infrastructure already exists. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Toronto, or if you look at Mississauga, more than half of neighborhoods are losing population. We have schools throughout the city that are at risk of closure because not enough children live near them to go to. So we have this huge misallocation of public resources and this huge lack of imagination about how we can get people participating to build housing. And one of the best ways you can do it is allowing people, especially older homeowners who've had families, they've seen their children move out and they would love to stay in their <clears throat> communities. And that gives them an opportunity to participate even in a do-it-yourself fashion okay. to contributing to yeah. solutions. Let me go over here though. I want to, uh, you talk to people every day. You mm -hmm. talk to lots of people, you talk to your listeners every day. I want to know if they're more upset at the notion of a four-story something being built in their neighborhoods to accommodate, I guess, the gentle mm -hmm. density that they call it, or are they more, uh, you know, are they offended at that notion, or are they saying, yes, build it, bring it on, we need more homes? What do you hear I, from people? Well, the sentiment is, just do it. I mean, to your point, thinking outside the box, we have hundreds of government buildings, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal, and they sit vacant, and they do nothing for years other than collect dust. Those are the kinds of things that could be retrofitted, could be made into co-ops, could be made into affordable housing. That stuff doesn't happen. So they'll sit there for the next 20 years. That's a lost opportunity. If you want to solve a crisis, start thinking outside the box now and not 10 years from now. Bottom line is I think most people want to make sure that there's a process in place. Whereas I understand, I agree, we have to build up in Toronto and there's so many opportunities. Every street corner, you should be looking at the building and saying, are there places above it? Can you build up? Yeah, there are. Everywhere you look, they miss the opportunity to build up by allowing just one level. But who do I go to as my counselor would be the concern. I think most people would say, if a rooming house all of a sudden pops up, let's say a developer's got four or five houses on one street that they were gonna develop, but now they've thought, you know what? I don't need the hassle. I'm just gonna make them into a rooming house. Maybe you've got a, a landlord that's not there. Who are we going to talk to? The council that has no power anymore to solve it? I think if there's no accountability and checks and balances, that will become a very big problem. Let me put this to you. Is there yeah. still too much nimbyism among you and your colleagues, which therefore justified the province bringing forward this measure? not justifying removing the basic tenets of democracy. Uh, I think it's actually really healthy for us to discuss better ways to consult, better ways to make decisions. And I think that we should constantly see our democracy as a work in progress and we need to make in improvements to it. But not to simply dismantle the basic tenets of democracy, which is that the majority rules and the minority is heard. I mean, that is the basic framework of a democracy in any elected body around the world. So uh, no, it does not merit that. And frankly, if this government, the provincial government, was serious about affordability and 
actually addressing the housing crisis, they would recognize that it's their own doing that often does themselves the most damage. Uh, they, they removed rent control off all units, new rental units built in Ontario. Uh, they are the threatening blame goes section... Back. Let's, let's be honest. The blame goes to previous man, governments. Man, it's not just... Like, but, they've but, been but, all but, 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 I'm, but I'm citing just the, the recent actions, and frankly, they're the government now that's making mm -hmm. Bill 39 mm -hmm. a decision. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they also are threatening Section 111 in the City of Toronto Act that would ensure that tenants who are removed from a building that they live in today because of a redevelopment have the right to actually afford to remain in their own neighborhood where their kids may go to the local school if they're a senior, a place that they've known for all their, for many years, and in a place that they can still afford to live in rather than live, live in another community far away from home and not be able to afford to live here. It's one of the few tools we have in the City of Toronto Act that makes that happen. Um, there are so many things that they could do, and including not removing the city's means through DCs to actually contribute toward building affordable housing. That's going to have a big impact on the city's ability too. Um, you know, Bill 109, many other bills that they've passed affect the functionality of our planning division to be able to expedite uh, some of these, you know, these permissions that you are hoping for because there's not going to be anybody in the office because they won't be able to pay the bills. The reality is this government has a lot of rhetoric about housing, but they're not actually fundamentally doing anything to help in substantive ways. And frankly, what they are doing is rewarding donors who have bought, purchased lands on the green belt. They are uh, saying a lot of the right things, but doing all the wrong things behind the curtains. And one of the things that they've done most recently is allow John Tory's request to move forward, which is to have a, a power grab of he and eight councillors having control of a, of a majority of council, which is just fundamentally wrong. And I hope that we can agree, even you and I, that as Democrats, that is not the way we should be making decisions, regardless of what side of the decision we might be on. All I know is, when you two go out for coffee, I want to be at the next table to decide. I, look I to want to listen to that. Or two, two. We're, we're plum out of time. we got to get this group back and continue this conversation because I know it ain't going anywhere. Karen Stintz and Eric Lombardi on that side of the table, Josh Matlow, Luca Bucci, Alex Pearson. You can hear her on AM640 on the other side of the table. Great discussion, everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you very thanks, much. Steve. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. There's an old expression, you can never get enough of what you don't need, or with more property comes more anxiety. In our minds and our hearts, we know this to be true, but we haven't seemed to be able to do anything about it. Paul Burton, the editor-in-chief of The Hamilton Spectator, has weighed in on this in his new book. It's called Shopomania, Our Obsession with Possession. And Paul Burton joins us now here in the studio. Great to have you here. Nice to be here. I, I, I really did enjoy the book, which surprises me because I hate shopping, but you've, you've really nailed it here. And let's set up our discussion with the following quote from your book. You write, we shop because we are happy and we shop because we are sad. We shop because we have too much money or not enough. We shop to give our lives purpose. We shop for recognition. Much has been written about people who shop not to acquire stuff, but to assuage anxiety, boredom, heartache, illness, or imminent death. Paul, how long have we been like this? Oh, I think we've been like this since we stopped hunting and gathering. And the moment that we didn't have to carry stuff around, uh, we started appreciating, you know, shiny rocks on the ground and, and, and probably even before that. So that is more than a couple of decades ago. <laughs> We're going way back. Yeah. Uh, here is, um, well, here's how you described some that you saw a long way from here. And let's do another graphic here, shall we? Bright-eyed, friendly, and constantly smiling, they appeared to have no manufactured toys. There was, of course, no television, no packaged goods, no games, no puzzles, very little furniture, no Western items whatsoever. But they did not seem unhappy. In fact, quite the opposite. High on the cold and windy Himalayan plateau, the weather bleak and unforgiving most of the year, the visitors few and far between, Modern entertainment in short supply and provisions scarce, even if you could afford them, yet life went on cheerfully. They did not appear to want for anything. Who are these people and why are we not more like them? <laughs> Those are, uh, that was a family I stayed with uh, when I was traveling in, uh, in Ladakh, which is in northern India. And I was struck by especially the, the children who are, you know, without toys and the, the modern conveniences and, and always smiling and always happy. I was 
a, a cold, so I, I would have appreciated some heat. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they were rosy-cheeked to playing outside all day and having fun. And they didn't seem, in your judgment, to think that they were missing anything by not having all the consumer goods we drown in. Yeah, I think when they see travelers with gadgets today, you know, they might be intrigued by, well, they probably all have a cell phone now. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, whatever is, whatever is coming down the, down the pipe. But they don't have the, the ability to purchase much of it, and probably not much of it is, is arriving there, although I haven't been in years. So for all I know, it's a, shop, it's a, it's a, it's a big shopping mecca. <laughs> <laughs> there are those among us, the super rich, who apparently need 50 cars, 10 houses, thousands of pairs of shoes, etc. Why? Well, if you, if you, if you, you know, the book talks a bit about Elton John or, or Nicolas Cage, they're big, big shoppers, and I have a lot of fun with them, and they have a lot of fun shopping. Uh, I, I think that uh, they just can't help themselves. Uh, Nicolas Cage has nine, had nine Rolls Royces and 15 houses. Uh, there's no explanation for it other than they're addicted. Does more stuff bring you more happiness? Uh, more stuff could bring you more happiness, but the, the, the evidence shows that it doesn't really. Some stuff, of course, makes us comfortable. I mean, we want a comfortable house and, and clothes that are warm and food to eat. But uh, I don't know how anyone could be more happy with nine Rolls Royces than one. You don't have nine Rolls Royces? <laughs> no, I guess you don't. Your newspaper, The Hamilton Spectator, where I actually worked once upon a time. Yeah. I'm trying to think how many years ago that was. About 43. Yikes. Told a story of a woman named Sharon who won 10 million bucks in the lottery. What happened to her? Yeah, we, we, we wrote that story and called her the penniless millionaire. She won $10 million, like so many other lottery winners, that, uh, and I cover a few of them in the book. Um, you know, they went immediately on a shopping street, bought I mean, McMansions and more cars than they needed, and went on trips and gave a lot away to their friends too and had fun and then realized uh, just a little bit too late that you know the bank account was emptying more quickly than they had anticipated and that uh, i think she had three kids who needed an education and she also needed a you know place to house them and in the end we revisited her years ago years later and she was you know riding a you know an electric bike and taking the subway and back at work hmm. and and said you know uh, life has more meaning when you're not shopping. Now, yeah. uh, I do like the fact that you don't spare yourself in this book because you do point out that you bought yourself once something called a storm glass. What is that? Yeah, I was in one of those typical museum uh, stores. This one happened to be at the Botanical Gardens at Cornell University in New York. And uh, I was intrigued by it in the store, uh, bought it carelessly, brought it home, took it out of the package and, and then looked at it and said, well, well, what am I going to do with this? You know, it, 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 a storm glass is supposed to predict the weather, but, you know, we have all kinds of fancy machinery, none of which I use and, or, or ever read the newspaper a weather page or anything like that. I don't know why I bought it. And where is it now? It's still on my wall. I put it there as a reminder of... Uh, of, of, a, of a miss shop, as I say in the book. A miss shop, okay, okay. And that's not the only example I hasten to add here because <laughs> you once, I'm going after you again, you once camped out overnight in front of a store with your son so you could be among the first in line to buy, of course, the latest incarnation of some kind of video game, and it was November, so not exactly, you know, a beautiful summer night. Why did you do that? Well, he asked me, he was about, I don't know, 12 or 14 at the time, and, and, and th this a, a product was coming. It was the perfect example of a shop of mania where there's a, a limited amount of, uh, of product and, and a lot of demand for it. And he said, hey, Dad, can we, can we get one of these? And I need to camp out overnight to, to get it at the Best Buy or wherever it was, the future shop. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You know? <laughs> he said, no, 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 we need to get in line. So... I said, okay, well, we'll go over at night at 10 o'clock and see if there's a lineup. If there is, we'll wait in line. But I, of course, thought that was preposterous. There'd be no lineup there. And so we drove over and he said, I'll just put some deck chairs and sleeping bags in the car, Dad, just in case. <laughs> and when we got there, oh my goodness, a lineup was already beginning. He said, quick, let's get in line. So you did and, so you, we, and you got it. We sat there all night long. You went and we got it, yeah. <laughs> 
Here's another quote from the book. We wanted it rather than needed it, and now we realize we can't use it, but we're stuck with it. It looks so good in the store, we decided to buy eight packages. But now it is at home, we realize it is quite useless, and we put the other seven packages in the basement or garage. Our heirs will shake their heads in disbelief when they clean out the garage when we're dead and gone. We overshopped. Th this is from your book, and I put that on the record because you and I both know some fairly respectable people who have overshopped. Can I show you an example? Look at the monitor here in the studio. What was Jesus Christ really like? Was he gentle, meek, and mild, as the old hymn has it? He was nothing of the sort. Was he the Prince of Peace? Not if you believe his own words. And was he as fond of his mother as popular tradition suggests? Now that is one of the country's greatest ever writers and broadcasters. Do you, do you know who that is? I certainly do. Who is that? That's my father. Yes, that was the, <laughs> the great Pierre Burton, your dad, who you tell us in the book had 150 bow ties and 50 pair of cufflinks. How come? Well, that's a good question. I suppose, I mean, his bow tie was a, was a signature, so he needed a lot of them, although 150, come on. <laughs> and the cufflinks, I think he just collected. He, he had a million collections. He had a collection of masks. When I he and my mother had a collection of, of masks from around the world, which were terrifying to me as a child. But uh, uh, yeah, the house, it was a chaotic house that was full of a lot of stuff. There is this funny expression that shopping is sort of retail therapy. Uh, some people are actually quite afraid of that retail therapy. Why is that? I, I think that, I think that people um, I, I, are nurtured by stuff and uh, the continuous flow of it through the house or through their person helps uh, make a boring day brighter. Hmm. Uh, and I know that we all feel that, even I feel that when I, when I, when I acquire something, like the storm glass, for example. Hmm. It's not until you get it home, you go, oh, I've got buyer's remorse already <laughs> and it's only been you know, four hours. How much shopping is done to keep up with the Joneses, as the expression goes? Well, that is a huge thing. That's you know, that's thirty or forty or fifty percent of it. We want to, we want to, we want, we want status. We want to be part of a group. We want to be part of a community that has it, and we want to be part of that conversation. Is that necessarily, therefore, a bad thing? Shopping is not a bad thing. Shopping is a good thing. Shopping, as I say in the book, I mean, without shopping, we wouldn't have math and languages and, 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 and innovation and exploration and all kinds of great stuff. But over shopping, you know, one Rolls Royce, maybe it's good. I, I, that's debatable, but nine. You probably don't need nine. Yeah. Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary was a guy named Steve Mnuchin. And his wife, Louise Linton, once posted a shot of herself getting off Air Force One, and this was the copy that was associated with this, I don't know, was this an Instagram post? I think it was. Uh, here we go, we got a, there it is. Great hashtag day trip to hashtag Kentucky, Linton wrote. Hashtag nicest, hashtag people, hashtag beautiful, hashtag countryside, hashtag, I don't know what kind of pants these are, Roland Mouret pants, is that how you say that? Hashtag Tom Ford sunnies, hashtag Hermes scarf, hashtag Valentino rock stud heels, Hashtag Valentino, hashtag USA. My question is, who does that in one of the poorest states in the United States? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 well, she took a lot of heat for that at the time, as you may recall. And I think this is, this is status gone awry, you know, trying to impress everyone with what you're wearing and what you own or what you have or, or your, 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 your so-called good taste. And, and uh, so many of us, in a modern world are, are simply not aware of uh, what people don't have. But, does, I mean, did, you would have thought that being married to a multimillionaire as she was and showing up in Air Force One as she did, that you wouldn't necessarily have to be, like, yeah. why would you lord it over people like that? I just, I still am a... It's, it's, it's never enough. And that is hmm. one of the conclusions of the book. It, it's never enough. This all might be amusing, and a lot of the book is very funny, actually, as you read it, except for the fact that, that too much over-shopping may, in fact, be killing our planet. Do you believe it is? Uh, I certainly do believe it is. In, in fact, that's the theme of the book. It's, it's often silly, but all, always serious, this book. And, and 
you know, if you think of the amount of uh, uh, garbage, just simply garbage that we're shipping to the developing world or garbage that's filling up our own uh, uh, suburbs or, 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 or rural areas or or landfill sites. Landfill sites. Yeah. I mean, they, they talk about in the book, there are landfill avalanches in some of these uh, w countries where we've mm -hmm. shipped so much garbage and people are climbing through it looking for stuff. <clears throat> the, 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 the society we live in makes it far too easy to throw stuff out and mm -hmm. far too easy to buy it. So we've really got to twist that around a bit. What does that look like, that twisting around? What should we be doing? I think the, the first thing we could start with is municipal, municipalities should start charging more for garbage. So in most municipalities, although not all of them, a, a few progressive ones charge per bag, but most of us get to put anything to the, to the curb for free once a week. And so therefore, when we're buying stuff, we're not thinking about how to get rid of it. We know we can just drag it to the curb and it'll be gone in a week. If we made it expensive to take it to the street, then we would, one, stop buying it, or two, tell manufacturers we don't want all the packaging. And that's a big part of the, of the, of the, of the problem, is the packaging, not necessarily the stuff. Right, consumers have power. Why are we not exercising it more? Yeah, exactly, because we don't have to. It's too easy. Now, you said in the midst of that first answer there, we can put out as many bags by the curb as we want for free. Others would argue we actually pay for the right to do that through our property taxes. Not the case? No, exactly. We pay through it for through our property taxes, but why not lower our property taxes and increase the price of garbage disposal? Therefore, everyone wins, right? If you want to put out more garbage, put out more garbage, but you'll have to pay for it. Now we're all paying the same amount, so it doesn't help it doesn't do me any good, any financial good to sort of reduce my footprint, which is what I try to do. No incentive to be smarter. Exactly. Hmm. Everyone from Jesus Christ to Rabbi Hillel to Henry David Thoreau has said something along the lines of, on guard, be on guard against covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, this has been established wisdom, what you're suggesting, for a very, very long time. Why do we refuse to get the message? Because people like stuff. <laughs> People like stuff, we, we, we can't stop that. We can only try and think about it more and say, how much do you really need? And there's a lot of uh, passages in the book, as you know, about people who collect stuff. You know, Jay Leno has 100 cars and Tom Hanks collected uh, 250 typewriters and Corbin Berenson, for some reason, has 8,000 snow globes. I mean... <laughs> 8,000 snow globes. 8,000 snow globes. It's a, it's, a, it's a human thing. We all have a little collection. I, I don't think I do, but I have books, as I talk about in the, in the, in the book. I, I have a lot of books, and I, even, I still got a lot of books, even though I'm mm. sort of shuffling them out of the house regularly. Uh, have we got ourselves into a situation, though, where so much of our economic well-being depends on people who shop too much? It does. In, you know, uh, 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 presidents and prime ministers around the world say, you know, are, are, is your life better now than it was four years ago? Can you do more shopping? Have you, do you have more stuff? And indeed, the, the, the retail sales are one of the, the leading economic indicators. So there's, nothing, there's no way around that yet. Although, as I say in the book, who is it? Uh, Douglas Copeland, I think he says, you know, there's no shopping in Star Trek, which is, a, <laughs> which is a, this great quote. <laughs> yeah, he's right about that. <clears throat> Uh, you remember what George Bush said after 9-11? One of the first things he said? He said, go about your daily business is the best way to, you know, beat the terrorists, which was, of course, shopping. Go shopping, yeah. yeah. He basically yeah. said go shopping is a cure yeah. for terrorism. Yeah. We knew what he meant, right? We knew what he <laughs> meant. Do you think it has to be this way? I don't think we're ever going to stop shopping. I think people like stuff. I do think that it doesn't have to be this way exactly. I think that we can temper our desires, our understand our obsession with possession. I think that we can be told that we can't keep throwing this stuff out. I th and I think the only way to tell us to rid of this, as I said earlier, is to, to, to make that expensive. And it's going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, we don't really have to lobby governments for this. They're going to realize it on their own. Mm -hmm. You say we can do it. But will we do it? 
I think that we will. I'm optimistic. I believe that the world will get better, that there still will be shopping. It, there just won't be so much of it. Or it will be done in a different way, or it will be more sustainable, or it will be in a, in a circular rather than a linear fashion. I mean, the, the life of a, of a good. Uh, I, I appreciate your desire to be optimistic, but I'm going to bring you crashing down to earth now by saying that if we do what some people suggest, meaning that, let's take the lawnmower. There are, let's say, a, a neighborhood of 20 houses. Probably pretty much all of them are going to have their own lawnmowers, even though 99.9% .9 of the time, all those different lawnmowers are going to sit in the garage and do nothing. If we did, as many people suggested, and that is, let's say, pooled our resources, we're going to buy one lawnmower for the whole neighborhood. You cut the grass on Monday, you cut yours on Tuesday, yours on Wednesday, etc. That way, we can all get away with one lawnmower instead of 20. That might make more environmental sense. It could also put a lot of people who make lawnmowers out of business. How do we deal with that conundrum? Well, I don't know. I once belonged to a tool library, and I actually uh, uh, borrowed a lawnmower every week for that for a, for a while. It, it didn't. It lasted only three years, and then I was stuck without a lawnmower <laughs> and without neighbors to <laughs> cut my grass. But um, I, I think that I think that we have to get there. You know, li uh, book libraries are the best example, right? You're reading a book once. Some of us refer to books regularly, but you know, most of us read the read the novel and and then don't need it again. We can share these things better. What it will do for the economy, I don't know. But the economy has, has suffered worse uh, shocks in the past. Just most recently, the pandemic is a good example. Or mm -hmm. all kinds of other ones. We'll emerge from it as a different world and in a, in a sort of a different consumer society, and it'll all be fine. I guess the last question is, do you actually want people to shop for a book called Shopamania? Well, as I say in the book, a, a friend who read the manuscript said, why don't you call it Don't Buy This Book? <laughs> So I hypocritically <laughs> tossed that one out. But yeah, I, 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 think, I think that there is a, a good message for all of us to be had in the book about the environment and, and, and possession and consumerism. It is a delightful read. Shopamania, our obsession with possession. And it's brought Paul Burton to our studio tonight. Paul, thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, November 29th, 2022. Today is Giving Tuesday, a day to help remind people to donate to the charities of their choice. And since TVO is a registered charity, here comes a little nudge from us. Donor investment in TVO's current affairs enables us to do the important stories and tackle the issues that matter to Ontario. So if you're inclined, you can help by going to tvo.org slash Giving Tuesday. And if you do so before midnight tonight, the Wilson Foundation has generously offered to match all donations to support TVO's journalism up to $100,000. Thank you, Red Wilson, for your wonderful generosity. Tomorrow, what's driving the rise in food costs? We're looking into that. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.